And we're going to the next step in the evidence, and I'm going to hand this to Bob, and he's going to introduce uh, the next speaker to deal with back your evidence. Bob, thank you. Thank you. Is that a projector in anybody's way? Is it? Did everybody see the slides? Okay. All right. Jeff White, who will be the next speaker in relating to back to our photographs, has done more work on the subject than anybody else. He's been researching this case since 1964. One of the world's leading experts on the photographic evidence in the Kennedy case. And what he'll be speaking about is photographs taken allegedly by Marina Oswald although she initially denied taking them, now admits to them, just remember how many she took. Originally, she was asked how many she took, she said, I didn't take any. Then when they showed her one, she said, oh yes, I took that one. They showed her two, she said, oh, I took those two. And then we showed her three, and she said, three. And all in all, we have evidence of at least four. We do have three. The fourth one was destroyed by Oswald's mother, and she allegedly flushed down the toilet. But the thing is, it's important evidence. Why is it important? Lee Harvey Oswald, while he was still alive, was shown one of the photographs, which eventually appeared on the cover of Life magazine. And when he saw the photograph, he said, that's a fake. He says, I don't have how that's done. I've worked in photo labs. I know he, someone else's body might be spaced on it. Well, he was right. And had he lived long enough, he probably could have proven it. Well, he did live long enough to prove it. But we have with us somebody who can, Jack White. Assassinations Committee to uh, come up and show my work to them. And, uh, they brought in various photo experts and decided that these were genuine photographs. But after you see what I'm about to show you, I hope you can decide for yourself. Uh, I'm not going to try to influence you one way or the other. Just memorize how the photographs are. Uh, Slender the Proof Conspiracy in the JFK murder. Uh, we have this photograph of supposedly of Lee Harvey Oswald, which appeared on the February 21st issue of Five Magazine. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. And as uh, Robert said, uh, we think this is a photograph, uh, this photograph is a fake, as you see here, and I want you to uh, decide that for yourself. Uh, in fact, Robert Blakey, one of the few things that uh, uh, good, that came out of uh, their study of these photographs is this statement. If the backyard photographs are invalid, how they were produced poses far-reaching questions in the area of conspiracy, for they evince a degree of technical sophistication that would almost necessarily raise the possibility that more than private parties conspired not only to kill the president, but to make Oswald a passive. I think he stated that very well. in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas, uh, the backyard of which uh, the photographs were supposed to be made. Uh, here is that backyard. Uh, and as Robert uh, mentioned, Marina's stories about these pictures changed uh, frequently. Uh, she said that uh, first she didn't remember taking any pictures, then she remembered one, two, and so forth. Uh, this is the small sheet camera which supposedly she took these pictures with. And you have to understand uh, her testimony as to how she took these pictures. She said she didn't even know how to operate uh, the camera. That Oswald came to her and said, take my picture. She took a picture as he showed her. She didn't even know how to roll the film. So, so she then uh, took the camera to Oswald. He rolled the film. She went back and supposedly took another picture and then another picture. But keep in mind that in both, uh, all these uh, pictures, both the subject and the photographer, were smoother. Uh, then the, uh, the story of finding the camera itself is uh, rather incredible. Uh, despite the Dallas police having searched uh, the Ruth Lane residence uh, two different times, and uh, the second time in which they supposedly found these photographs, they found no camera that was capable of taking the photographs. The camera was turned in by Robert Oswald, 
uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's brother on December the 10th. And uh, he claimed that it had been found among uh, Lee's possessions. Uh, it's incredible to me that the uh, police have examined this residence twice, spending about six hours, and, and yet they didn't find the, uh, the camera. Uh, I obtained copies of these photographs from the National Archives uh, oh, about 19, early 1970s. And uh, because also had uh, told Captain Will Fritz uh, that these were fakes and yet he didn't have a chance to prove it, uh, I'm in the graphics business. I did graphic arts and photography. And I thought, since Oswald couldn't do it, maybe I can uh, prove that uh, these photographs are fabrications. Uh, this is uh, Commission Exhibit 133A. This is Commission Exhibit 133B, the lesser known of the two photographs. Then in 1975, a third photograph uh, surface, which supposedly didn't even exist. Uh, the Dallas police had testified under oath that they found only the two pictures at the top and a negative of one of them. Uh, but here is absolute proof that they were lying. A third pose. So we know that the police lied under oath about the finding of the pictures. Uh, then we have uh, this picture. Uh, which surfaced during the House Assassinations Committee. Uh, this is uh, the DeMar Shield picture, and it uh, enables us to further prove that uh, the pictures are uh, fabrication. Uh, some of the early work on these pictures was done by a researcher in California named Fred Newton. Uh, and I'm going to show you a few of uh, Fred's slides here, uh, which show one of the things that uh, Fred noticed was, was that the figures seem different height. Uh, the, the figure at the left appears to be a taller person than the figure at the right. Uh, here's a slide showing that when you make the head sizes, uh, the two figures the same, uh, one of the figures is uh, quite a bit taller. Uh, but perhaps the most important thing that Fred noticed uh, was what we call the world's first uh, chin prints plant. Uh, if you'll notice, there is an interruption in the silver grain of the photograph uh, right across the chin area where you see the dotted line. It's, it's very obvious when you uh, examine the photograph carefully. Also, you notice that the shape of the chin in the 133 a photograph that did not at all match Oswald's chin. Notice that Oswald has a rather uh, pointed chin with a cleft in it. And that's not at all what we see in the uh, 133A backyard photograph. Uh, well, carrying uh, Fred's work a little further, uh, I made some of my own comparisons. Here are the two photographs uh, compared to the Dallas Police smoke shop of Oswald. You can notice uh, readily that the, uh, when compared with this different photo, uh, that the shape of the chin is totally different. But here's even more uh, convincing proof uh, that there's something strange about this photograph. When you make the head size it's the same, and you have transparencies made of the two photographs, you can overlay one photograph over the other in the area of the face and it's an exact match. Here is a blue transparency of 133A, the red transparency of 133B. And when you lay one over the other, every place that you see purple is an exact match. Every place where you see red or blue is not an exact match. And what's quite obvious is that the only place you see red or blue is around the mouth area. In other words, you see purple on the ears, the eyes, the nose, the chin, the hair. But notice the lips. Uh, 
In 133A, we have smiling lips. In 133B, we have downturned lips. So you have closely uh, the photographs match everywhere except the lips. Uh, this indicates to me that this area of the photograph has been retouched by an artist, uh, changing a single Oswald face from a smiling face to a frowning face for the purpose of making the two pictures uh, look like different poses. Uh, here's a picture of myself showing that when you when your lips are upturned and a smile, and then you turn them down in a, a what you might say is a frown, uh, your lips are connected to the rest of your face, and therefore other parts of your face should also change if you change your lips. And in fact, I challenge you to go uh, home and stand in front of the mirror and try this for yourself. See if you can move your lips independently of the rest of your face. It, it can't be done. Well, a lot of people don't really understand the retouching. Uh, I'm a graphic artist, so I'm real familiar with how to uh, retouch photographs. In fact, this is one I did for one of our clients. Notice the hammer has a label on it and a uh, logo up on the claw part of the hammer. Uh, it's very simple for a talented artist uh, to do retouching like this. Uh, in fact, uh, <laughs> sophisticated job, but uh, it just indicates that anybody who's good at graphics could put a different face on a uh, body. Uh, well, let's look at these in a little more detail. Here I have uh, cropped some off the sides, uh, but printed the full depth of each one. And you notice that uh, one figure, uh, the figure on the left, seems fairly well centered in his face, uh, while the figure on the right, the feet are chopped off and you see more stairway. Uh, again, as in the uh, retouching of the mouth, uh, somebody was fabricating photographs here and wanting it to appear that they are different poses. So they uh, made the viewpoint appear to be different by uh, their cropping. Uh, in fact, uh, if you'll follow this, I put red lines across at the top of the head and across the knees of these. Uh, that helps you to see the relationship uh, horizontally there. Then when we get this third picture, the one that didn't surface to, till 1975, and which supposedly did not even exist, uh, it enables us even better to prove these photographs are fabrications. In fact, if they had been content to produce just one photograph, we would have never been able to discover that they're fakes. But by comparing uh, the three photographs that we have, it's very evident, I think you'll agree. Uh, what do you notice first of all when I put the uh, third photograph in? Well, the red line goes across the knees of all three. But look at the red line across the top. We have a, a figure in this photograph which is approximately four inches shorter than the other two figures. Uh, this sort of shows the same thing with a uh, different slide. Uh, again, the middle line goes across the pistol on all three figures. The bottom line goes across the right toe of all three figures. And the top line goes across the top of the head of the first two figures, but look how much shorter uh, the figure is in the photograph that was supposed to not exist. Uh, well. Perhaps this was one reason this photograph never surfaced, that there were too many things wrong with it. Then, my, my most important discovery in studying these uh, photographs over the years is the fact that whoever fabricated photographs was dealing with only a single photograph of the backyard. And anybody who knows anything about photography will understand exactly what I'm talking about, but I think I can make it clear to everyone. Uh, here we have photographs A and B. The green triangle is pointing at a sunlight highlight on a post about six feet beyond the foreground post. There's a post in the foreground holding the stairway up. There's another post back beyond it about six feet. Okay, notice that the, we have an identical highlight on 
this post from the sunlight that's exactly the same in both photographs. This means that the camera viewpoint could not have changed at all from side to side. Uh, given the way that Marina says she took the picture of walking around, handing the camera to Oswald to mind the film, moving back, he was posing differently. It's virtually impossible that you could achieve the exact same viewpoint side to side uh, moving around like that. But let's look at the verticals also. Uh, notice the red triangle. The red triangle points to the roof line of a house that's approximately 40 feet beyond uh, the stairway here. Well, vertically then, notice that the roof line of the house strikes the, the juncture of the post and the stairway at exactly the same point on both photographs. This means that the camera could not have moved up and down. So, given these two conditions, the absence of horizontal movement as indicated, <coughs> excuse me, as indicated by the green square, and the absence of vertical movement as indicated by the red square, we can only conclude one of two things. Either the camera was on a tripod, which we have no reason to believe, or there was a single backyard photograph being used by whoever fabricated the photographs. Is that clear to everyone? Uh, and here is even more startling proof that the photographs, the, back, the backgrounds are absolutely identical. Uh, I have made a red overlay of 133A and laid it down over a brown copy of 133B. And I've slipped in a piece of white paper so that it blocks out part of the, the picture so that you can see where they line up. Well, everything in the background is an exact match. Uh, the steps, the shadows, the posts, the garage. Does everyone see that the two photographs match exactly in that upper portion? And then when you check the lower portion, you have the exact same thing. This is impossible if under the conditions uh, the photographs were allegedly taken. You cannot have two consecutive pictures, unless the camera was on a tripod, where the background is identical. So we have these uh, possibilities. Either Marina took the photos, as she claimed, which is obviously, I think, absurd, or using a tripod, someone took photos of an unknown man in the backyard, uh, an artist added the Oswald face, retouched and photocopied uh, for the final version, or, and this is what I believe, a single photo or multiple photos from a tripod of the backyard was obtained. Photos of the man with a gun were superimposed by an artist who then added the Oswald face retouched and photocopied. Another interesting thing that I determined in my study was that the vanishing point is wrong in some of the pictures. Uh, if you study 133A here, my study of it indicates that the camera was absolutely horizontal, and yet you have a vanishing point which points downward. Uh, the, the vanishing point should only point downward if the camera is pointing downward, and it should point up if the camera is pointing upward. Uh, it's a rather technical point, and if you're an artist or a photographer, you'll understand this, but I think I can make it uh, clear to you. Uh, in other words, if the camera is tilted up, you will get a figure, as you see on the left here, if the camera is left with level, a rectangle will appear perfectly rectangular, and if you tilt the camera down, <coughs> the lines converge toward the bottom. Uh, it's uh, just a fairly simple law of optics. And this leads us to a, a very interesting question of how the uh, or a question and answer of how these uh, backgrounds were actually made uh, from an identical photograph, and yet if you examine the real photographs as the House Assassinations Committee did, and take measurements on them, you can't make them fit together. In other words, uh, the exact match that I showed you in the overlays was manipulated in the darkroom uh, to do this, to, to make 
let these match, I reversed the process that the people have used who prepared the photographs. And this again is a rather technical point. But if you make a normal photo of a rectangle, as you see on the left here, and you put the negative in the enlarger and project it down uh, at a right angle to your printing easel, you'll get a normal photo. If, however, you have a single photo and you want to make it appear to be different from another print of that same photo, it's very easy to do in the dark room, as any photographer could tell you. And this is accomplished with what's called keystoning. Keystoning is when you take a rectangular picture and you project it in such a way that it uh, appears to be a parallelogram instead of a, a rectangle. And you do this by just simply raising one edge of your uh, printing easel, as you see in this diagram. Uh, as you can see, the shorter distance that the black rays travel on one side uh, makes that edge of the picture uh, smaller, as you see here. Well, this was a very magic moment to me when I realized this. I had worried for a long time why these pictures didn't match each other, and it suddenly dawned on me one day that if I took the negative of one picture and projected it onto a print of the other picture, could I make them fit? And this was one of the things that sort of gave me goosebumps in my whole study of the Kennedy case was when I raised the easel, the two pictures came into exact register with each other. This proved that I had reversed the procedure that the people had used to make the two prints appear different because that's the only way you could do that. Now here's an example of uh, East on it. Uh, the center picture is the normal negative. And as you can see, if you tilt the easel in different directions, you get different effects. Well, in Keystone, you get two things. You get false perspective, which is a shift in the vanishing point, or, and, and I should say, uh, you also get stretch in the direction of the tilt. And you can see that plainly here. In other words, the picture gets longer in the direction that you tilt it, plus you change the vanishing point. Okay, in 133B, the camera appears to be closer to the fence. Uh, that's, uh, you can tell that because the fence boards are taller based on the full height of the photo. If the fence was really closer, then the perspective must actually change because the photographer has stepped forward. Object sizes, relationships, and viewpoints must change, but we've already shown that the camera did not move side to side or top to bottom. Uh, therefore, if relationships are not changed, false perspective, uh, a one-dimensional perspective, has been introduced in the dark room. And that's what I proved by doing this. Uh, and here is a demonstration of it. After I had uh, found that, I actually took measurements based on uh, the keystone that I found. Uh, if you take arbitrary units, for instance, between the post and the corner of the garage, and make that exactly the same in the two photographs, and then you measure from the little block of wood on the post at the top down to the bottom of the fence, you can see that from in picture A on the left, you have a much shorter distance than you do in picture B on the right by about five units. Uh, this indicates that the picture B demonstrates the stretch effect caused by the diesel tails in the dark room. Uh, another thing that these uh, people who prepared the photograph overlooked was uh, the direction of the sunlight. In picture A, we have the shadow of the nose going directly to the center of the mouth. In picture B, with the head tilted about five degrees, we still have the shadow of the nose going directly to the center of the mouth, although if you check all the other shadows uh, of the stamps and everything else, they all match exactly. Uh, this was Fred Newcomb's uh, slide of the same thing, showing the, that when the head is tilted, uh, the nose shadow does not tilt. 
Well, that introduces another very interesting point. If the shadow of the nose uh, being cast by the sunlight directly overhead causes that shadow to go to the center of the lips, what about the shadow of the chin on the neck? Well, on the neck, we have a shadow going off to Oswald's right. This is extremely inconsistent. I mean, the shadow of the nose should be the uh, exact same uh, as relationship as the uh, shadow of the chin. Uh, likewise, if the shadow on the neck is correct, then we should have a shadow on the right side of his nose. So there's a, a, a very strong inconsistency in lighting here. Uh, another comparison that can be made is if you compare the known length of the gun to Oswald's known height, uh, you have obvious discrepancies. Uh, so this, this photograph was restaged numerous times by uh, various researchers and uh, investigative bodies. Uh, people standing in this exact same spot, in fact this one was taken supposedly on the same day in 1967 that uh, the original photograph was supposed to have been taken. Uh, but none of these people could ever dare to change trace. Uh, none of the people that, that uh, attempted to restage this photograph could ever quite achieve the exact same effect. Uh, here you see the photo uh, A with some of the various attempts at restaging it. In fact, the Dallas police restaged the photograph, as you see at the bottom. It says investigators restage Oswald photographs for comparison. But let's look at which photograph they used as a basis for restaging the backyard photograph. It was the third picture, which supposedly did not even exist. Uh, here's another very interesting thing about the photograph. The artists who pasted or superimposed or mad inserted this photograph into the background overlooked a very basic thing. They did not consider whether they were putting the figure in according to the laws of gravity. If, if you uh, check the post in the background, draw a vertical line down that post, and then draw a parallel line down through Oswald's uh, head to arrive at a point of balance, you find that his point of balance falls about four inches outside his weight-bearing foot, which is very strange. And you may have never really thought very much about that until you look at the picture this way. Does it seem possible that a person could be standing in that position. I mean, looking at it in, the, in this unfamiliar manner, you just think that's absurd. Nobody can stand like that. Uh, and then when you check the photograph with some of these other photographs that were made, you find very interesting things. Uh, when I overlay the Oswald picture with the picture of this man standing in the backyard, I find that I can make the shoulders match, the right arm match, but Oswald's left arm is much too short. Or, to put it another way, if I line up the gun and the elbow, the shoulder is way off. This indicates that the left arm in the Oswald 133A picture is much too short. Well, I went to the backyard several times and determined that the, the uh, Stairway had been reconstructed. Most of the Oswald picture is where the red line in it is, and not where uh, you actually see it there because the, the stairs have been uh, reconstructed. Uh, but in going there, I made, took numerous measurements, and knowing Oswald's height, and knowing the height of the post, I made comparisons uh, with Oswald's uh, known height and his head size and the size of the post and I found that Oswald at 5'9 should have been, his head should have been where the blue line is. In other words, his right foot is out exactly square with the, the post. Uh, the, the post is 5'7 and a half, Oswald was 5'9 and so his head should have been where the blue line is instead of where the head line, the red line is. Uh, indicating that the figures in there are much too large. In other words, also, as you see in there, would be six foot three. 
Uh, I also determined the height of the lens, which was very simple by determining which uh, piece of siding on the house was exactly horizontal. Uh, this was important because it helped determine uh, exactly which direction the lens was pointing, uh, enabling you to determine the correct vanishing point. Uh, I also made comparisons of a, an actual uh, police mugshot of Oswald and found that the head was much too big, uh, as you can see by the red lines when you compare it uh, with Oswald uh, made to the same height. Oh, it's just it's another one of the same thing. Uh, I also compared shoulder widths. If you check, if you measure, if, if you make the heads exactly the same height on an arrest picture of Oswald and the 133A picture, you find that uh, based on a nine and a half inch head, which is an average head height, uh, that the arrest picture of Oswald shows a person whose shoulders are 14 and a quarter inches across, and yet the 133A picture, based on the shoulder widths, uh, it would give you shoulder width of 16 inches. You can see that it's, it, it's quite a bit different from the arrested Oswald. Uh, likewise, you can uh, study the neck widths. Uh, the arrested Oswald, based on the same head height of the two figures, would have a collar size of 14.9, which is a rather average uh, neck size. In other words, the neck across there is four and three quarters inches if the, if the head is nine and a half inches tall. And yet, the backyard photograph uh, shows an Oswald with a five and a half inch neck, or he would have worn a collar of an incredible uh, football player size uh, 17.2. Uh, there are several other very interesting things. I've already, I've already shown you that the left arm is much too short, but if you examine this photograph carefully, and you look at the right hand, and then you look at the left hand, you determine easily, just by looking at it, that all the fingertips are missing off the right hand. There are no fingertips, no fingernails. The, the final joint is missing uh, on all four fingers that you see there. Don't they look kind of stubby to you? But the left hand is perfectly normal, long tapered fingers with fingernails. There, you can see it a little better. Does that look odd to anybody? Also, this was another comparison I made, just showing the difference in neck sizes. Uh, I made all three of these head sizes exactly the same. And everything on all three of them matches exactly except the neck size and the chin. The chin and the neck size. Uh, calculating the size of the neck, uh, you can see the buckshot of the Oswalds would have uh, had about a 14 and a half color size. Uh, the backyard photograph has over a 16 neck size. So, uh, why does a scrawny little fellow like we know Oswald was uh, require a 16 and a half uh, size collar? Uh, but uh, let me back up. There's only one thing I want to point out on this slide, and I want you to try this. You can either do it there in your seat, or you can do it at home later on. And there, there are numerous things to talk about here, but I'm only going to talk about the one labeled D, the uh, left hand of Oswald. He's supposedly holding these two communist newspapers in his left hand. Notice the slant of his shoulders and the slant of his thumb. The thumb is exactly parallel to the shoulders. And yet his uh, elbow is down at his side. Try this right there in your seats. See if you can get your elbow at your side and your thumb up, your hand up as if you're holding two newspapers, and get your thumb pointed downward like you see there. Can you do that? It's, it's anatomically impossible, especially to hold a newspaper and do that. Uh, also, one other point I might make is he. Uh, the, the left wrist has a wristwatch on it, and we have never seen a wristwatch on Oswald in any other photograph, nor do any records indicate that he owned a wristwatch. Uh, to 
show you uh, some of the dishonesty of the House Assassinations Committee. Uh, let me demonstrate from Figure 4 uh, here in their volumes, uh, which compares various photographs of Oswald's face. Uh, the photographs they're comparing are the Dallas Arrest picture, the Marine picture, the New Orleans picture, the Russia picture, and the backyard photograph. Now notice on this uh, graph, based on these pin rows, size, and shape coefficients, calculated from the facial indices, notice that the backyard photograph is the furthest out from the way Oswald looked in Dallas. But let's see how they arrived at these uh, figures. We, we have this table here that shows all the measurements that they took uh, to arrive at that graph. But let's look. Uh, the yellow marks here indicate that in the backyard photographs, there are four omissions of measurements. Well, what are those? They're number four, seven, 13, and 15. Let's look at those. Well, nose length was one. I don't know why they omitted that. Earlobe length is one. Look here, though. Chin width, number 13. You've already seen what a wide chin uh, Oswald had in the backyard photograph. If they had included the chin width alone, to say nothing of these other things they eliminated, the backyard photograph, uh, Penrose coefficient, would have been clear off the graph. So they obviously left it out. It's uh, just a very dishonest investigation. schedule, I think I've uh, shown you enough. Here's a uh, slide from uh, the uh, DeMar Shield picture, which Robert Grodin uh, pointed out to me just recently, uh, has a large bulge in the side of his neck. Uh, one more thing, let me, let me conclude with this and we'll, we'll get on with it. Uh, the photograph of the rifle, this is a photograph of the rifle made in the National Archives. Here is the same rifle in the backyard photograph. If you superimpose a picture of the scope off the actual rifle on the backyard photograph, you find something very interesting. The rear of the scope is missing. You can see the middle of the scope and the forward part of the scope. But in retouching, the photograph, whatever artist uh, fabricated this, retouched the, the uh, scope in such a manner that he left the shadow of the scope, you can see the shadow of the scope, extending over the stock of the rifle, but the actual part of the scope itself is not there. Uh, there are probably ten more slides or so that I'll conclude at this time and turn it back to Robert. Parts of the, uh, the research. I was wondering about the photo retouching. There are several different areas where photo, uh, <coughs> photo retouching does occur. As I mentioned before, the autopsy photographs, of course, the backyard pictures. This is two of the most famous and uh, most critically attacked. I'm going to run through the rest of the slides at a somewhat accelerated rate, so we'll all have a chance to uh, to see everything as fast as we can. Then we'll show the film to the assassination. Uh, and then we're going to have a, a question and answer period. Uh, Gary and I will be up, uh, Cyril will be up, 